Get ready, Melbourne. On Saturday, August 30, Hardware and Tsunami in conjunction with Kiss 90 FM present Hardware 11. Performing live, the legendary CJ Bolland, direct from Germany, also featuring Melbourne Sonic Animation. Venue Shed 14, Victoria Duck. A lot of other people there is actually a culture for me I truly believe that there is a culture and it's based around a whole lot of people getting together and getting into a warehouse and just dancing all night long ravers uh, get together they um, there might be what 500 a thousand or even 5,000 whatever the number of people there and everyone just dances all night long putting 16 uh, high-end track spot systems in the middle there on the centerpiece streak with eight HPEs on the outside which are your big lights and then I've got the small lights in the middle. people all throughout Australia interested in this alternative rave culture and began to do their own things locally and the culture very quickly spread throughout Australia. Hi. Hello. <laughs> we're at the docks Hi. and we're going to hardware which is a rave. It's adrenaline. <laughs> uh, a 90s Woodstock. <laughs> Everyone coming together. No, I'm not quite. don't go to raves just don't understand the concept of the techno music at all because they just think it's 
They don't understand that there's one song that mixes into another, that mixes into another. They just think it's one big long song that's just bang, 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 bang. Basically a 4-4 four, four rhythm comes from an African beat and um, that's one of the most primeval beats, you know, in the whole universal language of sound. Uh, that beat and the repetitive nature of it, is a tra it induces trance-like states. And trance music, even though um, in techno music there, there are certain forms of music called trance, I believe all dance music is a form of trance music or can become a form of trance music in its purest form. When you're dancing and then the music's rising and rising and you're dancing to it, it is just this big emotional, physical and everything release and it's just great because the music's good, you're feeling good and you're just releasing all this energy mm, from everything dancing. Go. And, just and now, the music like... takes you on a journey. It's kind of like the tribal fire all over again. People dancing around and, and kind of losing themselves and wanting to reach ecstatic states. Um, states that make them feel as though they are more than just their flesh and blood. Techno music, basically you have to find your own element in the music. You have to hear what the music's trying to say to you, whether it's like subtle or whether it's obvious, whether it's an obvious aggression or whether it's an obvious uplifting sort of sound or whatever, but you find your own element in music and you interpret it for what you believe. In, in finding, for the, for the punter to find his element in the music, he usually has to find the DJ which shares his taste and that's where you um, find DJs having their following of, of regulars. They'll say, oh, Jace Knight, I love his music, and they'll follow him around the clubs. There's other people that follow Simon around, there's people that follow Richie around, and there's quite a few other DJs out there which have got their own following. Yeah, I suppose the DJs are teaching people something new about music all the time, and that's what happens in dance music. That's why I find it so interesting, is that it's constantly changing. You're constantly getting new ideas, com completely new. I mean, you think you've heard everything and then something will come along and blast your mind away. DJs act as kind of uh, these sort of sifting creatures that uh, compile stuff and put it together into some sort of cohesive way at a party. They'll manipulate records. They may not play a song from beginning to end. The songs may not even have a beginning, middle and end because they may be a certain genre of music which isn't such for so formulated, which gives them the ability to manipulate and layer records and perhaps some DJs even take the concept further and will not only have one song playing one time but two, if not maybe three songs playing together. In, in a sense they are remixing the original piece of music. When you're up above a massive crowd, it's really a powerful feeling, you know, and it's very easy to sort of allow it to kind of be become something where you are a star, but I think we've always had um, this attitude that uh, techno and rave was, was kind of about killing off stars. And stars are a thing kind of from rock. Because I, I don't even look up if I can help it. I don't want to see the crowd, really. I feel my way through it. I don't look if I can help it. I don't like being on a stage in front of people. I hate it. But other DJs love it, so, you know, it's, it's different for everybody. The role of the DJ at those uh, rave parties is kind of like that of a, a shaman in Eskimo or Siberian culture. The music acts as a, a focus point. The rhythm, the beat, it creates a sort of hypnotic experience where young people can have a sense of meaning, a, a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging. Your heart beating is like the thump, thump, thump of, of the music in techno. And it just feels like it goes straight through your body and that you're part of that music. And the lasers bring that in with it as well. Well, I interpret what I hear into what I see with my lights. I mix it real time with the music. If the music's happy, my lights are happy. If the music's, you know, aggressive or dark, and so are the lights. It's just a whole togetherness. It just 
just like the, the um, you're just one person with a thousand other people, you're just like this joint force or something. Anything which draws people together in the way that Rave does is excellent because it's promoting uh, an exploration and, a, and an experience of a mass consciousness aspect as opposed to a totally individualised consciousness aspect and I think that's an important theme of development and evolution for humanity on the planet at the moment is to learn mass consciousness aspects. In the early 80s, in, certainly in London, in Thatcher's England, there was a sort of de-industrialisation of the central zones of London, a lot of big empty buildings um, doing nothing. And we'd basically move into one of these large sheds, live inside it, and spend two or three months fully mutating the interior. We would then throw the doors open and invite, oh, I think the last party we did in London had 5,000 people in there. You didn't get a big glossy flyer A4 size, you got a grubby little photocopy, you know, half the size of a cigarette packet. And if you had one of those, you were in, you know. And, and half the, because we were moving around the whole time, we were always getting evicted from one place and having to find somewhere else. Half the battle was finding the new place, and the kids loved that. Where the hell is this one? You'd feel like you know, you were the only people who knew about it. The people who were in this community were the only people who knew. You didn't, you couldn't, you know, tune into the radio or anything to find out where to go, what was going on. You sort of had to be in the know. And I think that's what gave it that sort of really communi like communal sense. Everyone sort of felt together. And if you'd walked on the street and you saw one, someone wearing baggy clothing, you'd think, oh, they're a rave, like, great, you know, kind of thing. And you'd feel sort of a bond, an instant bond with those people. I think at an age when you're in your, your late teens, as I was when I was right into it, 18, 19, I was pretty insecure about my looks. I was pretty insecure about being picked up, um, that whole kind of thing was pretty scary and raves were a place where the guys and the girls looked exactly the same. Even to a point where the boys kind of shaved their heads and that kind of made them all look like a bunch of babies. Yeah and I think it was just a reflection of the fact that we all wanted to regress a little bit and go back to being like little kids. We all had little fluffy toys and we sucked dummies and we sucked chuppa chups and wore fluffy hats and, and were very, very childish and it was a safe place where you could um, sort of indulge in, in drug taking and, and roll around on the floor together in a really uh, platonic, platonic way. The rave culture and dance culture definitely actively goes out and tries to create a sense of unity and love and hopefully equality and that's something that the rock and roll world I've found doesn't do. People can feel a sense of unity with a whole lot of people that you don't know from all different walks of life or different ages and cultures to come together and feel one whilst doing something that you absolutely love and that's dancing to music. The raves were really multicultural. There were kids from every kind of background and it really represented, I think, the different percentages of national groups that we've got in Australia. I think because dance music pretty much doesn't have many vocals, you don't need to have a good um, understanding of language to appreciate it. This is the first time in the history of the planet that people get excited about buying, you know, like you know, some kid in the street will oh, get really excited about finding this hot track from Japan or from Italy or, you know, Sweden or something. I mean, people were never interested in buying music from those countries before. And now they are because it doesn't see boundaries in terms of language or anything. It's actually, uh, within the underground, it's a very hip thing to find. Oh, listen, I found this in a, re a really hip new record from Finland or whatever. It goes beyond the rave scene. There's that kind of like a, I guess you could call electronic culture, or just it's just a new a new culture. Young people and I guess old people as well are kind of looking into the space of the computer, hearing these synthetic sounds, seeing these synthetic images, and they they kind of it's it's resonating with them on it on some sort of deep level that um, is creating an identity for them. It is a cultural thing. It's an experiment with using computer-generated imagery to represent the mood, the um, structure, the feeling of uh, this music. 
it's part of that the trying to, to get that process of synesthesia kind of happening where um, sound becomes image and the image can become sound and so on. It's a culture that reflects fastness, excitement, speed. I mean, we do live in a time where we're inundated with information, uh, our lifestyles move uh, quite fast, particularly coming from the city, and I guess we're also an MTV generation with you know, lots of changing images and everything really quickly. And that's reflected in rave design. The images are sort of, they're, they're sort of like a neon plasticky sort of looks. They're really bright, saturated colours. They're always really sort of pushed right to the limit. You know, I can remember one uh, operator saying to me, like, oh, you know, you, you're, you're going into illegal levels of luminescence. And I was sort of going, wow, what's that? You know, and, and so um, I said, great, let's push it further. So when you're having a hallucinogenic experience, colours seem a lot brighter and very intense and lights are very intense. And I guess the Dago colours are for when they're not on drugs and, and it just references that brightness and intensity of colour. LSD was there for the hippies in the 70s, I'd guess. Ecstasy has replaced that for the ravers and the dance scene in the 90s. All well, your st stimulations are exaggerated, from feeling to wind blows to people walking by to just someone smiling at you. This is just straight out euphoric it's happiness. You see someone you don't like and you're going to give them a hug. It's, it's just such a positive thing that people have had a bad week. They're going to maybe plan on getting that ecstasy tablet for Friday or Saturday night. During my little raving career, I've seen people having fits and spasms in the middle of the dance floor. Unbelievable, you don't know what to do. You don't, there's, there's no one around that can help you. Everyone just stands around and looks, doesn't know what, they don't know what to do. Because you're having such a good time, you don't want to have to bring yourself down by this, this person having a fit on the floor. Because I think the kind of effects that a drug like ecstasy has on you, you can become very close to someone that you didn't know within 45 minutes and be telling them everything about yourself. And so a lot of uh, relationships developed that wouldn't have in a really intense way because of the, the environment was set up to, to help that develop. A few people just get ultra, ultra skinny, um, disgustingly thin, and paranoia is the biggest thing. Unless you are in that rave with your drugs, if you saw a really good friend walking down the street, you'd duck into a shop so you, had, you wouldn't have to speak to them. It's very dangerous uh, buying illicit drugs because of the fact that you really don't know what uh, you're getting when you're purchasing these things. Well, they could be buying a variety of materials from glucose, to uh, magnesium sulfate or Epsom salts, amino acids, vitamins, flour, anything from the kitchen, to some fairly dangerous materials. A lot of people do not understand that the whole... You go to a rave or you're a hardcore drug dealer, drug taker, smack addict or whatever. Yeah. That's what you get put on you. If you set up SNR and they don't know anything about it, oh yeah, you know, went to a rave. Ah, you know, because they've got this opinion that, like, the media or whatever's put onto them, that it's just all about drugs and that people are pushing drugs onto you. And people just... are going to have drugs in anything. Yeah, no matter what. demonised the rave scene and rave parties in particular. They've tended to focus on the drugs, they've tended to focus on the fact that these are sort of shameless, orgiistic exercises. What one has to understand is that 80% of young people in Australia today, by the time they're in year 11, will have experimented with at least two illicit substances. It is much better for them to do that experimentation and to use those drugs in an environment which is safe rather than under a bridge uh, where there's no one around. If they do uh, aspirate their vomit and become unconscious, they're just going to lie there and die. So a lot of people actually prefer to just do, use music, like myself, as a drug. Uh, because the thing is that, especially what I listen to and what I make, is a drug. Do you know what I mean? And I think that, like, you know, this whole 
drug drug thing, you know, it's actually quite irrelevant. I don't know, it's just the music creates all like an atmosphere and yeah, and everyone just whoever likes this music, you know, they come here to have a good time, to have a dance. Yeah, the energy that's um, generally created by the music and the vibe is perpetuated within the crowd. Uh, one person who's out there just beaming out on the music will have three people around him watching him going, I want to be there too, and it's a chain reaction. It just grows in the crowd. You watch it from the DJ booth. There's people dancing in the middle of the crowd and it just works its way out. And next thing you know, the whole room's just buzzing. in a way like nothing's changed it's still the, um, the Dionysian urge and people still want to create music and celebrate but instead of going into the forest with jugs of wine and lyres and harps and stuff like that it's technology that's creating music and it's um, if you look at the substances that are involved in the culture it's the design of drugs Part of it is uh, putting aside itself a bit in a kind of communal experience. Everyone's influenced by extreme debut levels and sensory overload, light shows and sculptural kind of pieces. And the first kind of goal is to experience that technological vibe and human machine interface, I suppose. You see a synergy created by a lot of people all liking the same thing basically. You see a lot of smiles on faces when you walk through the crowd. You see a lot of people just letting loose, you know, in their own little world. It's like a no alcohol zone, quite amazingly, which is a totally different vibe for young people. You're not putting up with the same sort of politics that you come across in pubs. There's no, there's no aggressiveness or roughness and um, yeah, much more and androgynous based culture. This is almost like achieving what some old lefty said many years ago about if I can't dance to it then it's not my revolution. It's that kind of feeling and even if that's illusory, anything that gives people a genuine sense of that must be a good thing in this atomised, individualised society where everyone feels so bloody alone so much of the time. I can see similarities between rave culture and a religion in that they're both celebrations and they're both very ritual based in celebrating the spirit and most people go along to celebrate their religions on Sunday mornings for an hour at church whereas most ravers are standing outside as the sun's rising, peaking on their experience of the night and the sun rising and being at a party, filling up on the unity of the spirit of the party.
good night and then you find out you have a good night and you get to bed and you can't go yeah. to sleep. Even though, you know, you just had a few drinks or something and you get home and you're just wide from all this energy from other people. Oh, I'm sure that the young ravers that I know that go there don't really give a toss about, you know, whether it's a cultural subgenre or not. They just go, they have a good time, and that's the important thing. is for what? 